Is that your prayer tonight? God, draw me nearer to your precious bleeding side. Good evening, everybody. Oh, good evening, everybody. Oh, okay, all right, there you are. It is so good to see you in the house on today. To those who are online, we say good evening to you. Happy Wednesday, everyone. It's amazing that we're already halfway through this week. And as we're making our way through, we believe that the Spirit of God has visited with us here. What do you say, everybody? Amen. To God be the glory, great things he has done. We have been enjoying our time in South Africa, and we want to say thank God. Thank God for the Santon Church. And thank you so much for Pastor Simon Kane. Thank you so much again for the opportunity to be here. I'm going to ask you to do this every night. Would you play, please, please, please say amen for your pastor? Amen. amen. We thank God for the set man of God in this house. And we believe that God is going to do amazing things through Pastor Simon Kane here at the Santin Church. Man, and part of that is revival. And, you know, I believe that God is reviving the heart of God's people this week. My prayer has been, Lord, if there's not yet a fire, at least let there be smoke. I'm praying that for somebody, if there's not a fire, that your house and your car have been a little smoky this week. That God has been visiting with, with you and reminding you of what we've been talking about. And my prayer is that these messages would draw you nearer to your Lord and Savior. Our theme has been revive us again. We've talked about the fact that though a healthy person should not require revival, that we as spiritual beings often find ourselves in need of revival sometimes once a month or once a week. But God, even though someone else might give up on our ability to change and to be better, God never gives up on us. And we want to say thank God for once again bringing the idea and the opportunity of revival to us so that this time the train will not leave without me. The song says, God, if you're doing anything in this season, please don't do it without me. I don't want to be left out of what God is doing, and so I'm praying that you will join with me with what God is ha having happen here at the Santon Church. As we've been talking about Revive Us again, we started with the recipe for revival. And our elder read for us the passage that we used for our foundation. Second Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14 says, But if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sins and restore their land. And we learned that the recipe for revival requires us to humble ourselves. That means that we submit control of our lives to God. Number two, that we pray. It means that we ask God for the specific help that is needed. Then we seek his face. That means that we are actively pursuing the presence of God. And then we turn from our wicked ways. That means that we're abandoning 
everything that offends the presence of God. And I'm praying that if you haven't started your list yet, that the Holy Spirit begins to nudge you when there is a place that we need to abandon. God, please help us to be uncomfortable in the places where you are uncomfortable. I don't want to find myself at home in places that God has left. Lord, have mercy. I want to be where God is. And last night we talked about the fact that we serve a God who does not just restore things or health. God restores time. Oh, my goodness. And many of us find ourselves in places where we wish we could go back, but God does not require us to go back. He says, I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten, the canker worm, the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, the great army which I sent among you. Oh, yes. God has promised that God will give us back payment for everything we lost in the battle. And I'm praying that somebody has received payment today. Oh, my goodness. I can't wait to hear your testimony. T tonight, I want to stay in this passage and, and go a little deeper in what God promises to God's people as we talk about revival. We read this last night, but I want to ask you to read it a little more closely with me today. It's Joel, still chapter 2, but we're in verse 28. And it begins this way, then, after doing all those things, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions. In those days, oh my goodness, the Bible says, I will pour out my spirit even on servants. The people serving at KFC going to receive the Holy Ghost, men and women alike, and I will cause wonders in the heavens and on earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. And then he says, the sun will become dark and the moon will turn to blood, red before that great and terrible day of the Lord arrives. And then he says, but everyone, somebody say everyone, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For some on Mount Zion in Jerusalem will escape. Just as the Lord has said, there will be among the survivors whom the Lord has called. Oh, my goodness. And then I want to read with you today another passage that will illuminate what it is that we're saying. It's Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. If you have the ability to highlight this or to underline it, I want to advise you to do so. They read this way. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also, having believed, you were what, everybody? Sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory? I'm going to have a good time preaching tonight. Replace my strength. Ah, oh, y'all ready? Into my heart, into my heart, come into my heart, Lord Jesus, come in today, come in Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Sing out of my heart, out of my heart, out of my heart, Lord, out of my Shine out, shine out of my Lord Jesus, Lord 
ti shine out today shine out to shine out always shine out always shine out of my heart lord ti God, we need you. We need you every day, but we really need you now. I am still learning regarding what I am about to teach. And so I'm asking Holy Spirit, once again, be my teacher. And communicate your truths to your people. We need you now. Speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. And it is in Jesus' name we pray. Let all of God's people say, amen. Replace my strength. All over the world, people with advanced and enhanced melanation are seen as strong. Have you ever had someone come to you and say, you're such a strong person? I admire your strength. And while we're just doing what we have to do to make it from one day to another, we are required sometimes to assume superhuman strength just to pay our bills from month to month, to, to put food in the refrigerator from week to week, sometimes we find ourselves going to Herculean lengths just to make it come together. Have you found yourself wondering where you're going to get the strength today to deal with your children? Oh, I know in South Africa you have some children who, who, who have some opinions that are not like yours, and, and we have to call on the Holy Spirit every day to say, Lord, how do I deal with this boy or this girl today? We have to operate in strength. But being strong all the time is exhausting. It wipes us out. And we find ourselves all over the world with lifespans that are shorter than the people around us because of the amount of natural stress that is baked into our experience. The fact that we not only have to care for our children, but we have to care for our parents as well. Stress when we are not sure as to whether or not the, the means that we have today will be able to carry us toward retirement, stress. When we're not quite sure what the lump is that we felt, stress. When we find ourselves trying to find petrol and, and how are we going to put gas in the tank, stress. And I find here today that many of us have come in here today and we look one weight, but we have the weight of the world in the seat with us. The things that we are wondering about, the questions that we are asking, the relationships that are holding on by a thread require us to hold on to things that are too heavy for us to carry. So what do you do when your simple existence requires more of you than you have to give? What do you do when what is the bill for you existing on this planet is more than your accounts have within them? What do you do? Well, we know what some of us do. Some of them. Let me say some of them. I don't want to offend anyone. Some of them go drinking at night. It's too heavy. Some of them take on extracurricular activities and extramarital affairs. It's too heavy. Some of them smoke some funny things. Not in South Africa. People are doing many strange things in order to cope because the reality is that the weight that we have been required to carry is too much for us. 
And the challenge also comes in the fact that many of our parents, as well-meaning as they were, shared with us that it was a requirement to figure out how to pick up that weight. Told us that there was no room for excuses. That you have to be twice as good when in you go in those spaces with other people. That you have to be three times as smart in order to give half of the opportunities. And we found ourselves believing that this impossible scenario is what our, our life is made up of. And so we find ourselves worn out, simply existing floating from one place to another, sometimes forgetting on the way to a destination where it is that we're going. Has that ever happened to you? You walk into a room and you forget why you walked in there. I don't know what I was looking for. Let me go back and see if I can remember it again. Too heavy. I, I want to liken it to load shedding. <laughs> Somebody said, you're too close. <laughs> yeah, when I, I came the first time I was introduced to this dynamic. Uh, a, a, a way in which a system that has been asked to handle too much tries to carry the weight. And so we find ourselves as sometimes turning off some things that should be on. Ignoring some things that need attention. Oh, come on and hear somebody. Finding ourselves with some of our kids who are disgruntled with us while others of us, of others of the children believe that we're the best thing. We just can't handle it all. So sometimes we just have to turn a few things off and come back to them later. I don't know what credit is in, in South Africa, but then some of our credit scores in the United States reflect that sometimes what we turn off is the payment of our bills. Maybe not here. And so our credit re reflects the fact that our money is load shedding. <laughs> some of us, it's our health. We have not gone to a physician, haven't checked anything out. Low shedding. Now well, here it is. In the natural realm, when you're in a place that is a part of a load shedding system, you are at a great advantage if you can find a generator. Uh, power source that can hold you until the system gets it together. Oh, yeah, thank God for the generator that just is a gap between, that, that, that holds us until the lights come back on, holds us until our load shedding time is over. But as I was praying about this message, God let me know that not even generators are God's divine plan for his people. Because watch this, we, we find ourselves sometimes load shedding with church. Watch this. And so we use church as a generator to keep us until we can get our personal life together. Oh, I'm coming down your aisle. Sometimes the generator is our job. And so because we cannot find satisfaction in any other place, then we run to the job for the affirmation that we desire. Oh my goodness, the generator is good, but watch this. The generator, the presence of that generator still indicates that the system is broken. <laughs> what if we could come off the system altogether? Find a power source that's not dependent on that system working. Here I have a house with some solar panels. Does the sun shine in South Africa? I think I felt some today. What if we had solar panels in every home 
so that we could allow the people in government to figure out whatever they need to figure out. But as long as it takes, or however long it takes, I still have power. Oh, wait, what about wind power? Does the wind blow here? Come on, saints, don't leave me. I believe that what God has in store for his people is a power source that is not dependent on our ability to lift heavy things. What if God is offering something that does not require us to always have it together? Now, look, I, I took some creative license here. But our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was baptized. <laughs> and the Bible gives us a sneaky cue on how Jesus is going to manage his time here in ministry on earth. The Bible says that as he is baptized, when he comes out first, his father makes a declaration. Those who can hear it do hear it. Behold, this is my beloved son in whom I am. I am well pleased. God gives his affirmation to Jesus in the beginning. And the Bible says that as God is giving his affirmation, as the Father is declaring he is pleased with Jesus before he does any miracles, before he opens any eyes, before he raises anyone dead, the Bible says that also with that affirmation comes a force. Ah, comes a person, comes an individual, and the Bible says that the Holy Spirit lights on him like a dove. Woo! And the Bible lets us know from the very beginning, from the very time that he is still wet with his baptismal water, that the Holy Spirit is right there with him. And the Bible lets us know, number one, that Jesus does not do anything in his ministry without the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to be clear with you about this, that Jesus... Jesus was present at creation. We believe that the Word says that it was at His Word that, that it was, that He commanded and it stood fast, that He stepped out into nothing and He created everything. But watch this, that even though Jesus in His own self had the power to do whatever He wanted to do in and of His own person, that Jesus chose not to do anything without the Holy Spirit. Watch this. Jesus did not get up and eat his breakfast without the Holy Ghost. He didn't have a conversation without the Holy Spirit. From moment number one, the Holy Spirit is now the driving force and the leader of Jesus' ministry. And somebody needs to hear this on today. Maybe you're online because many of us have believed that the way that we are to get the, uh, uh, what should I say, the praise of other people is to show how we can do it ourselves. You have been around toddlers who are learning to open things and learning to put on their shoes and learning to put on their clothes and learning to match colors. And we have watched them try to do things on their own and make a mess. But what if God is watching us the same way as we try to pick a spouse without help? As we try to open a business without help? As we try to run a church on our own, could we be like that toddler with two left shoes on because we have chosen to do things on our own? Jesus did not walk one step in ministry without the presence of the Holy Spirit. Oh my goodness, he comes out of the water and right at the beginning of his ministry, he has a conversation. John chapter 4, we find him sitting next to a well. The Bible says that he necessarily had to go there. He had an appointment and he finds a woman there, a woman who's a woman of Samaria. And she's there at 12 noon, a day like today, carrying a tin jar, excuse me, a tin gallon clay jar by herself in the heat. 
She is the representation of someone who is carrying a load that is too heavy. And in the conversation with this woman, Jesus parks with her. And, and, and you know the, the discussion that, that Jesus asks her for water and she gives him a smart reply. And then Jesus gives her the secret to our success. He says, if you had the water that I can give, that that water would allow you never to have to come to this well again. In fact, the Bible says that this well would bubble up in you into eternal life. Hold on, wait a minute. Wells are dependent on the rain. They're dependent on an outside source to fill them. But Jesus says that he wants to give her a water source that comes up and out of her. Oh, my goodness. So watch this. Jesus says, I want to give you a renewable resource, something that does not require you to make, to diminish yourself and to give a pound of flesh in order to give to someone else. I want to put a source in you that will both refresh you and refresh the people around you. And could it be that that's exactly what the Holy Spirit is? Is that what he's talking about? Wait, maybe it is. Maybe it is that Jesus is giving her the secret to his success, that Jesus is not burned out. Jesus is not frustrated. Jesus is not cursing people out. Jesus is not cutting people off in traffic. Jesus is not quitting the ministry every week. Jesus is not getting rid of these disciples that are crazy because he has power that is not his own. Are y'all hearing me tonight? Jesus says in John 5, 30, by myself, wait a minute, the one who spoken it was, who commanded and it stood fast. He said, by myself, I can do what? Wait a minute. We've seen you do things by yourself. But are you telling me that even though you can do it by yourself, you have chosen not to? Jesus says, I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just, for I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. Wait a minute, because many of us find ourselves here on tonight, on this Wednesday evening, right here in November, and we are displeased with how heaven has been treating us. We feel that we have been faithful enough. We feel that we have given enough. We feel that we have been altruistic enough. And we give rides and we give food and we give opportunities. And we are not happy with what heaven has given to us. But Jesus says that he does not even judge his own experience by himself. But by the one who sent him. Jesus is experiencing something different than we are. Zechariah 4, 6 says, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might, come on, somebody read it with me, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. That God is not calling us to be part of the strongest member committee. God is not calling us to be part of the strongest saint committee. God is not calling us to be the one to bear every child in the family, to bear every adult in the family, to be the one to be the only one to show up every time Santa and church needs something. God has not put that burden on our plate. God says, I'm not looking for you to show up. That's my responsibility. God takes the well-being of our souls and everyone around us personally. God says, I'm the one who will do it. You are just a vehicle. Does this make sense, anybody? Oh, my goodness. So here, 
John 15, 5 says, yes, I am the vine. You are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do You don't have to raise your hand. But is there anyone who has been struggling with a fruitless vine? Results that are slow or non-existent. You've been toiling at this thing for a while. It's not working. I want to ask, are you connected to the vine? Or is the dead result that you have been nursing the result of a dead connection with heaven? Do we need to plug back in tonight? Oh, remember, we have a recipe. We know how to get back. Now as we look at the vine, and if that vine is clean, maybe that's our indication that we need to get by and get back. But I want to share with you one other thing that's been on my heart because I realized that while we have been trying to do business on our own and doing relationships on our own, do you know that we're trying to do spirituality on our own? That we have literally been trying to serve the Lord without the Lord's help. Wanting to show the Lord that we are so good that we don't need his help. Oh, come on and say somebody. You know, and, and when I grew up, maybe this is not you, I learned a theology that said that the ultimate result of my connection with Jesus would be the ability at some point in time to do the work of Jesus without Jesus' help. Can I debunk that before we go home? So 2 Corinthians 1.22 says, And he has identified us as his own by placing the Holy Spirit in our hearts as the first installment that guarantees everything he has promised us. In Ephesians chapter 1, we've looked at that before, the Bible makes the claim that it would be the Holy Spirit who would not only give us the power that we would need to get through day-to-day -day responsibility, but the Holy Spirit would be the identifying card that God would look for at the end of time to know whether or not we are approved for glory. That God is actually looking for the Holy Spirit in us. Not the length of your dress. Can I talk tonight? Not the color of your face. Come on. Not your age, not your station in the church. God is looking for God in you. Oh, come on, let's go ahead on. That God is saying there is only one thing that I am looking for in people that would identify and authenticate them as ready to be with me is that I am in them. <laughs> that the, the, the proof that you really are connected is that God is in you. This is why when we look at Jesus' preaching at the end of time, oh my goodness, at the end of his ministry, the Bible says that while individuals are standing at the throne and talking about the fact that they had preached sermons and talking about the fact that they had evangelized thousands of people, talking about the fact that they have gone on great missions for him, talking about the meals that they have cooked for him, Jesus says, depart from me because I do not, I don't know you. Can I pause and say, oh my goodness, 
If I came to all of these revivals and I was at church every week and I made sure that I cleaned out my refrigerator from whatever is unclean in there and I spent all of the money that I needed to spend to pay tithe, to return tithe, let me get that right. If I get, took my kids to Christian schools and made sure that I attended Christian colleges and I get to the end and God says, I don't know you. Lord have mercy. And many of us run the risk of being unrecognized in glory. Preaching and teaching and singing and on boards and in meetings and planning conferences and God does not know us. Lord have mercy. And I'm fighting about what color the carpet should be next. And I'm fighting about how long the service should be. And I'm fighting about who should be preaching. And God does not know me. Can you imagine God looking at you? You've been praying the prayer for church every week. Leading all kinds of Zoom calls and in all kinds of meetings, and you get to glory, and God does not have an inch of recognition in His eye for you. Lord, help us. And the way that God recognizes us is by God's Holy Spirit in us. That's why the Bible says, Ephesians 4.30, do not bring sorrow to or grieve God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Ensure that the choices that you are making are not making God feel uncomfortable in your presence. Remember that he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. It's his presence. It's our connection, our relationship with the Holy Spirit. That's it. For the Spirit, Romans 8, 16, joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And we, Lord have mercy, have made it about all these other things, about how we style our hair. Can I just talk tonight? Oh, my goodness. And he says here, uh, this is Paul writing to the Romans, that the spirit itself joins with our spirit. And the Holy Spirit with our spirit is how we are affirmed that we are God's children. I promise you I'll let you know he has, I, I mean, but then when the Father sends the advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and remind you of everything I have told you. The Holy Spirit is our guarantee. Because listen to this. When you have the Holy Spirit and you're about to do something you're not supposed to do, the Holy Spirit is going to let you know. Listen, and that's why many of us don't like to fool with the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit talks too much. <laughs> Holy Spirit likes to veto things that we like to do. Oh, my goodness, have you ever been in the middle of a movie, and you're enjoying the movie, and the Holy Spirit says, I think you should leave? Not on this side. Okay, over here. You, you ever been about to let somebody know where they can go and the direction that they can use to get there? Holy Spirit says, hold your peace. Oh. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit intervenes in our affairs. Ooh. <laughs> and there's a time where, or two where you see someone who looks mighty nice. They look great on stage. But then the Holy Spirit says, I know more about them than you do. <laughs> Come on, saints. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit is actually going to teach you everything you need to know. Ooh, you can't outstudy the Holy Spirit. Oh, come on, let me just go on. I, I promise. Yep, I'm giving myself a few minutes. Listen, some of us believe that our Bible studies are a replacement for the Holy Spirit. I know some people 
who will be in a red book, be in commentaries, but who will cut you to death with their tongue. I don't, I'm not, I use commentaries myself. But the commentary is not a replacement for the Holy Spirit. Mm. Uh oh, I'm trying to come down your aisle tonight. I promise you I'll get, I'll get out of your way in a second. So here it is. So Revelation 7, 14, Revelation 7, 4, uh, 1 through 4 says this. So then I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth. They were holding back the four winds so they did not blow on the earth or the sea or even or any tree. Uh-oh. And I saw another angel coming up from the east carrying the seal of the living God. He shouted to those four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea. Wait, don't harm the land or the sea or the trees until we have placed what everybody? The seal of God on the foreheads of his servants. And I heard how many were marked with the seal of God. 144,000 were sealed from all the tribes of Israel. Now, we have said that God identifies us with God's self. And there are some who will tell you that that seal is a whole lot of other things that are not God's self. I don't want to be too controversial, but I'm telling you here that there are angels who are holding back the plagues because we do not have the Holy Spirit. Come on, let me just bowl right down your alley tonight that the fact that you have not humbled yourself and prayed and sought God's face and turned from your wicked ways is holding up the coming of Jesus. Can I just, that's what, I came a long way. I just got to say what I got to say, right? Listen, you're looking at the government, God is looking at you. The angel says, hold back the wind until my people are sealed. And in one area, I'm going to say, ouch. I'm holding it back, but then I'm going to come over here and say, hallelujah, I'm holding it back. Because God is not okay with letting those winds go without me being safe. God delays his coming because God is abounding in forgiveness and mercy. He is not slack concerning his promises, as some would count slackness. What? But he abounds in mercy. He is not okay with the Santon church being left behind as he returns for his bride. And so he will hold back the winds as long as he needs to to ensure that every person at the Santon church that needs to receive the power Spirit has the time they need in order to get connected. Can I just ask if there's anybody who will say hallelujah, he's holding it back for me. Woo! He's waiting for me. He's waiting for me to get connected. He's waiting for me to come together. And he says, if I lack wisdom, he'll teach me how to do it. I don't have to flounder by myself. He is both the solution. He is also the key. He is also the judge. He is also the jury. God says, I am all you need. You just need to come to me. It's the way he did his ministry. And every other thing that we have been taught, every other thing that we are holding to, we need to reject it today. It is only God's power that is both going to teach us and empower us to live according to his will. It is God, period. It's the way that you can lead your business meetings. 
It's the way that God can give you the power to have innovation and power and spirit, not only to think it and not only to have the idea to put the contract together, but to also have the power to see it through to completion. The Holy Spirit can do that for you. It's the way that you can run your classroom. It's the way that you can do your business where God will give you the wisdom that you need for every particular case and every particular student and every particular member of the church, not by might, nor by power, nor by education, by my spirit. Yes, indeed, it's the way that we can bring the Sandton Church to a place where we can lead the nations in how to lead by the power of the Holy Spirit. Woo! And God, may not our media, may not our music, may not our attendance be the greatest legacy of the Sandton Church. May it be that when people come here, they find the Holy Spirit here, that they find transformation, that they find real power, power from God. Where there is smoke, may there come fire. Set us ablaze with your power and your presence. Tonight, I only can give to you the Holy Spirit. He's going to restore the years that the locusts have stolen. And then on top of restoring us, give us his power so we don't miss, mess up the restoration. He says, I can't depend on you to keep your dress clean. I'm going to keep it clean through you. These are they which have come out of great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And tonight our prayer is, come Holy Spirit. That's your prayer. Come on, stand with me. Come Holy Spirit. Oh, please. Come Holy Spirit. Do what only you can do. Someone else has heard a message tonight. It has spoken to your heart. You're asking God to deal with every breach that is an impediment to your relationship with God. It may be, well, I don't know what it is. God knows. You know. I want to ask you to come forward. God, I need you to go through like a surgeon in my life. And I need you to cut out everything that comes between my soul and my Savior. Come on, it's okay. No shame here. We're getting what we need on tonight. Oh, hound of heaven. I need you to sniff out everything that is standing between me and you. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And those who come, the Bible says, I will in no wise cast out. So whatever it is that you bring down, God knows what it is. Whatever it is you bring, God will not reject you tonight. The Bible says, whosoever will, let them come. Let's pray. Father, here we are. We repent for accepting the lie that we could do life by ourselves. Many of our ailments are not only because of what has been passed down, but they are a result of us trying to do life without you. High blood pressure, stress, Oh, my goodness, heart issues, liver and stomach issues. Because we were operating in our own might and our own power, we confess it tonight. And we ask you, oh God, spirit of the living God, free us from our dependence on ourselves. God, some of us have learned that we had to depend on ourselves because we have been disappointed by others. 
Some of us, oh God, have believed that you have moved too slowly on our behalf. We just moved on because we believed that there was a rush needed. But we have learned that when we do things without you, there is a cost to pay. I'm praying for somebody who is living the consequences of doing life without you. Would you restore to them the years that disobedience has stolen? And as we confess, God, we accept the promise that you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So now, God, we plead the blood of Jesus, wash us, make us clean in the blood of the Lamb. My friends, my brothers, my sisters have come because, Lord, we need you to remove from us some things that we can't remove ourselves. There are things that we've tried to do ourselves. We've laid them at the altar many times. They have come back. And so, God, we're asking for surgery on tonight. Take us to the operating room of heaven and begin to sever our ties with everything that stands between us and you. In the name of Jesus, turn the light on. Oh, my goodness. And we pray, oh, God, that you would search us and know our hearts. Try us and know our anxious thoughts. See what wicked things there are in us and lead us to the way everlasting. Purge us with his, oh, God, so we will be clean. Wash us so we will be washed. Light as snow. And we know that we cannot be trusted to stay white as snow. You keep us clean. Keep us connected, oh God. Keep us faithful tonight. Free us from the anxiety that we will fail. We no longer depend on the generator of our own willpower. We depend on you. Do your work. And I can't wait for the day where, oh God, you will identify yourself in me. <laughs> where you will see yourself on my forehead. Say, I know her. May that be the same for every person in here. Just, just a, I know you. <laughs> Oh, my God. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. We'll get to well done. But, Lord, before I get to well done, I want to get to I will know you. Oh, I just want to be known by you, God. Please do your work in me. Seal me, seal us is our prayer in Jesus' name. Let all God's people say amen and amen. Won't you elbow your neighbor?